Greetings everyone and welcome to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and today we're playing as the Siberian Black League, also known as Ant. So, if you'd like to read about the Siberian Black League, please go right ahead and pause the game as I go through the several paragraphs here. Uh, but, the Great Trial does approach for everyone, and if I remember correctly what I hear about Omsk, we are, as some might say, fueled by hate, but let us begin with the focus. The last days of Comrade Karbyshev. D General Dmitry Mikhailovich Karbyshev is dying. This is the fact that nearly everyone in the Black League is keenly aware of, and yet life continues as usual. The soldiers march through the streets of Omsk. The factories turn out as many guns as they can between bombings and much to Karbyshev's chagrin. The officers bicker as always. Comrade Karbyshev does not have long, and yet his energy does not seem to have left him, even in his last days. The general plans to tackle some of the greater problems facing Omsk with the help of his closest confidant and student, Comrade Yezov. With his aid in General Karbyshev's characteristic zeal, the Black League's course will be righted and we will march ever forwards along the path to the Great Trial. So, let's speed the game up. It's 1962, January 1st. Uh, the meet three is there. Very nice. And we're ultra nationalists. Not bad. And future perfect. Fragmentary ta text. Site 119. Kosin's. Kosvinsky common substructures recovered by the Northern Expedition 31 of the city's Ministry of Antiques or Antiquities Oh, Antiquities. Approximate date uh, OAC, or 0 AC. We were the generation that time forgot. Born in the ashes of our fathers, to the commands we marched. We were young and without choices led forward by deathless warriors. Taking the field to settle their accounts, shot with a starting gun. A blinding light and the sky collapsed beneath the weight of our sins. Our heroes unmasked as tricks of the light. So go tell our Spartans a slumber in their steely graves, that we, obedient to their laws, lie here, nameless of Kadra, 1307-56. Not even the gods fight against that necessity, so we have loot Vava terror bombing, which seems pretty far out since, yeah, we're not, I guess we're barely in the western side of Russia. We have the Fueled by Hate, I like that one. More attack and more recruitable population factors, pretty darn nice. And nothing left to lose for organization and less supply consumption, and a puppet in all but name. Ooh. Oh, that's not good. That's really quite not good. In which we lose political power. Uh, I forgot to do this as well. Let's see, what different type of divisions do we have? Uh, that's not terrible. That's, yeah, that's actually pretty okay. That's pretty okay. You guys are not as good. And then you all... Well, we're going to start with these guys just because it's cheaper. And on defense, it should be relatively okay for what we need. Also, we are at the beginning stages, so we got to scavenge for loot. we got to do all the sorts of stuff around here. Who do we want to beat up? That is a real question. Kok Shetau? Kokshitao. Oh, this is a person that can unify Kazakhstan, I think, right? Bandit Rabble, Steep Raiders, the new Khan. That's 10% more attacks, not bad. No unique focus tree, but that's alright. Alright, Intel Ledger. How many divisions do they have? 3 to 5. 3 to 5. Right class conquest, okay. Also, we're on the cutting room floor patch G for this Omsk playthrough. Just to let you all know. Ah, the modern bogatir. Of all the tales of the Russian anarchy, there stands one that has spread from the frozen lands of the Far East to the city of Kostroma in the West, and even deep into the lands of the, the Nazi Empire. The story of a wanderer, for parts unknown, who brings justice with them as they walk the desolate roads of old Russia. This wanderer has come to be one of the greatest enigmas in all of Russia. Little is known about this enigma. Some report they are a former ranger of the Ural Guard, a man who left his home to bring justice to the worst of Russia. Others tale tales of a former Wehrmacht soldier consumed by guilt and under a self-imposed exile as a penance to the people he wronged. A few scant reports tell of a widow from a destroyed village, seeking to bring to others the justice she was denied. Whispers in the East speak of an American volunteer from the West Russian War, stuck in a land not in his own, but still doing good where he wanted. Wandered. And in the bare or the bars of Siberian cities, one can always find strange and likely drug-induced tales of a man from the future, come back to save the world. Whatever their true identity and whatever the purpose in this corpse of the Soviet Union might be, all that is truly known is the kindness that they have shown to a people who so used to violence and death. Tales are told of the wanderer holding off entire bandit raiding parties single-handedly, liberating slaves or liberated slaves from perma tell of an angel of light freeing them from their shackles before disappearing into the night, and rumors have even come from Moscow of a one-man raid on Nazi strongholds. In the end, while many of these deeds are doubt undoubtedly fictitious, the actions of this hero, this modern-day bogatir, have lit a fire of hope in the hearts of even the most trampled upon in Russia. An interesting story, if nothing else. Our best bet would probably be attack these guys. In terms of trying to get loot. It, but it does depend 
if someone else tries to take loot from us first. Because if we can defend against them, and we try to attack them, then that would not be too bad. Especially since we have level skill level 5 for our general. Uh, redu review the Redemptionary Brigades against the Old Guard. Lessons of the First Trial. I kind of like that. Military factors would be actually really nice. More defense, ultra-nationalism, breaking the cliques. Ooh, time to end the squabbling, enforce discipline, trust in Yezov. I like the stability. Ooh, I want to get more daily political power because I've heard from my... From what I've heard so far, of course. Um, we're going to need a lot of political power for what we're going to do. However, I would like to grab that military, those two military factories quickly. The first trial ended as a Teuton burned our homes, tore through our defenses, slaughtered our soldiers, bombed our cities to rubble. In the end, millions of Russians now lay dead or enslaved. Many within Russia feebly wondered how this could have been. They wondered what terrible weapons or blessings the Germans had give, gave them their victory. General Karabyshev and Comrade Yazov, however, know the truth. The Germans accomplished this terrible victory through complete military supremacy, through both power and speed. As loath as we are to admit it, the old tactics are perhaps no longer applicable. It is time for a new way. If we are to defeat the enemy, we must use his own strategy against him. In which we have an option to do? Ah, scavenge for loot. Very good. Preparing for the end. It was one thing, thought the old general, to dread the failure of your greatest aspirations, to know the quiet burning of doubt in your gut. But it was quite another thing to look the twisted remnants of your dreams in the eye every day. To be constantly greeted by people, tripping over each other to obsequiously praise the vision and beauty of your own worst nightmare. General Dmitry Mikhailovich Karbyshev. Glavkarov of the Black League had clung to life on this earth for 82 years now, and he had certainly seen worse. He had lost friends to frostbite wolves and concentration camp guards on 300,000 kilometer over truck, overland truck back from Nazi captivity and Malthausen that had made him a living legend among the Russians. He was a man who could bear torture, both physical and emotional, but he could feel what was coming. It was plain for him to see. He saw it in the eyes of every fresh-faced youth cadre or recruit, and every projection of the next five years' industrial production. There it was, a simple fact. <clears throat> Shining like the sun in every geopolitical analysis of the coming trial and every snippet of hopeful speculation of the future, Karavashev's watch was coming to its end. The thought of death, the final rest from all of his earthly toils, did not phase him, but when he looked at the nightmare around him, he felt a panicky, hot-headed sense of urgency. His beloved league had grown corrupt and cruel, ruled by officer cliques and cronyism while innocents labored away in the redemptionary brigades. As painful as it would be, he had to try one last time. He had to address his sin, his unfinished work, and on this cursed planet before the long night claimed him once more unto the breach. Very good. He has his goals, and so do we. Happy February. We are never going to finish that. Goring is a successor. Oh boy. Well... Seem like we're building anything. That is big sadness. That is quite some big sadness. And we're also doing some research as well as some civilian construction speed because we can. After that, we'll go to the steel hut of Omsk. While the ge current geographical location or situation is not ideal, Omsk does have one great strength that it will get, try to give us. Or give us the edge over our rivals in the region, industry. Factories pepper the landscape and across Omsk workers labor to create as many weapons and defenses as possible. If Bukharin did one thing right, even in his ignorance, it was providing us with this tool of vengeance. Yet this must be expanded on. The construction of this new arms factory will begin effective immediately. And within a matter of months, new weapons will begin to pour from Omsk steel hut to the arms of our soldiers. I think I always say that wrong. Bukharin? Bukharin? I, I think that's how you say it, but you know what? Let me know if I say that incorrectly. Bukharin? I need to look that up. And of course, we are a warlord. We have no money things. Yeah, that's not cool. We need some more command power, too, so we can start doing stuff, but that's all right. So after that, I want to review the Redemptionary Brigades. General Karbyshev designed the Redemptionary... Redemptionary, yeah, Brigades as a means for those who had helped, served... Uh, served the enemy in the past to cleanse themselves. The sons and daughters of those groups that betrayed the motherland of the last trial would earn their salvation through fire and war. Fortunately, the current state of the League has betrayed this noble purpose. These days, the brigade serves the twelve various cliques that permeate the once great League. Jumal Karbyshev has seen this and thus will end it. The redemptionary brigades will receive new training methods, better equipment, and harsh but harsher standards. Their officer corps will be overhauled into truly loyal children of the Black League, and we will assure only those who truly deserve redemption will serve in the brigades through rigorous trials. When the day of the Great Trial becomes, the redemptionary brigades will march with us side by side in the defense of Russia, the aviators of the Black League. As they had been trained to do so, the cadres scattered quickly when the German bombers are observed approaching the outskirts of Omsk, moving in ordered groupings to their assigned shelters and positions and providing their identification particulars as they entered. 
to a 1. They all hated the Germans' high above with a burning passion, but they knew that until the preparations for the trials to come had completed, they were near powerless to strike back at them. So they sat and hated and disciplined in silence as the tremors of bombs had reverberated through the shelter's walls. Suddenly, however, the bombers stopped, as a dis and a distant report of machine gun fire could be heard. One cadre, assigned to observation duty, moved to the shelter's periscope, and after a moment, and with excitement, breaking through the calm demeanor, usually demanded, reported that the bombers were under attack by fighter aircraft. The other cadres fought to remain still, although they knew what that meant. The aviators had arrived, their instruction reinforced daily was clear, the aviators had, were strictly unreliable elements. But even when they delivered by dedicated officers, the enthusiasm with which lessons against failures to the north, nor the great enemy to the west, were delivered, were not present. None truly held the aviators in their hearts of hearts as an enemy. How could they when they fought and killed Germans on a near daily basis? Several minutes later, the observer reported a damaged German bomber approaching the ground on a trajectory for a crash landing, and the officer in charge asked for volunteers to venture out during the raid in each in search of protesters, or protesters, <laughs> prisoners. Every cadre present stood without hesitation, despite the danger. The aviators might have shot the bomber down, but the task was not yet finished. If any Germans had survived, they would soon wish they had it. Unlike all the others, they have not abandoned Russia, which is a good thing. It's a very, very good thing. Oh, we have two loot already, huh? Oh... You can do it against these guys, huh? Well, industrial equipment's always the way to go first. Oh, we can do it with these guys. Ooh, I don't know about... Novo Sobiersk. I have been recommended to play as Novo Sobiersk, so... Uh, these guys don't have loot. Well, maybe we'll shift you guys over. We only have four divisions, though, which is really just not ideal. There you go. Any upgrades? Is he an infantry leader? No, he's not. That's alright, though. And do we have a field marshal? Karbyshev. He can be offensive, that's good. And maybe Scavenger would be good as well, so. The Steel Hot of Omsk, in which we already have factories going, you know, artillery, motorized, support equipment, guns. We'll go to there now. Fighters are cool enough, let's grab three. If we don't have enough guns, there's no point to do anything, right? Wow, minus 1500, holy cow. Wow. Wowzers and bowsers, as some might say. But review the Redemptionary Brigades. That'll be good. That'll be very good. The Underground Manufactories. The din of an arms plant is loud. Laths, stamps, casts, all making an unearthly din as they churned out the guns that would sure be needed. Or surely be needed. Under normal circumstances, this would be irritating, but manufacturing in Omsk meant manufacturing underground, safe from German bombers and J Russian raiders. This meant every vibration shook the whole planet, every sound echoed off the vast concrete walls, and the pain of being in this swirling mess of industry was doubted, or doubled. This was necessary. Every industrial cadre assigned each underground plant was told this and knew this, for if they were to survive the next war, nothing could be spared in the defense of these factories. They would be the engine that kept Omsk running deeper, deeper into the earth. Oh, we get a civilian factory and more guns! Yes! I still not enough to go do anything though. Oh no. Why do you hurt me so? Well, that's much better. Much, 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 much better. Oh look, we can actually see what they have now. And I do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm in Omsk. Omsk is can be a nice place sometimes. Trust in Yazov. Dmitry Timofeyevich Yazov, long general Karbyshev's favorite student, has of late been the only man in the Black League. Uh the general finds trustworthy, a brilliant strategist dedicated to the idea of the League and loyal to his mentor. General Karbyshev believes it is well past time Yazov came into his own. Yazov will be given heightened responsibilities across the League as a whole, including supervision of the Redemptionary, Redemptionary, Redemptionary Brigades and the reforms of which he seeks to spearhead. General Karbyshev finds himself hopeful for the first seven years, for if anyone can see his vision through to its end, it is Yazov. The Downed Eagle. There's no one to blame but Martin himself. This is what he thought as his ME-264 fell out of the sky. He had been careless. He had flown missions over Omsk dozens, if not hundreds of times, which was a feat in and of itself, considering his 264 was older than he was and handled like a brick. But his recklessness had finally caught up with him. All it took was two good hits, and the left wing was sh sheared clean off the side of the fuselage, and the plane started tumbling downward. He could hear, or barely hear, his own screams over the thunder of the anti-aircraft anti-aircraft fire. He blacked out before hitting the ground in the waist of the Russia reaching up to claim him. Martin awoke face to face with his co-pilot, Johan. His sister's caved in. Martin screamed and sat up, his eyes wide, and the ME-264 was a fire wreck in front of him. Hellish red and white flames licked at tangled spires of metal. Heat rolled against his skin next to him. His crew was laid out on the ground, the corpse mangled from the crash. A small crowd was assembled in front of the wreck, silhouetted against the flames. Some of them turned their heads in his direction, he, his breath hitched. He scrambled to his feet and tried to run, but intense pain blossomed in his knee and he cried out, falling to the ground. There was coming. Wait, wait, he said, and turned onto his back. 
Three of the silhouettes rushed towards him. Their bayonets gleamed with murderous intent. He pulled himself backwards with his arms, palming fistfuls of dirt and throwing it at them. Wait, stop, stop, please. One of the silhouettes, no, a man in a black uniform, brought his boot down on Martin's face. Here to crunch and nothing more. Death is an occasionally a must-see. The state of the Redemptionary Brigade. You don't need to salute me, Kabyshev said softly. You've got, you're not legally a part of the League after all. The Ukrainian foreman, standing before him, lowered his hand slowly, his eyes seeming to pulse with nervous energy. The scores of suit-stained men who stood behind him, work boots half buried in a mixture of snow melt and mud that crowded around Karvashev and his meager retinue of bodyguards, eyeing the old soldier with worriness and an indescribable emotion that almost felt like hunger. I'm not here to punish you, Karbyshev said as loud as he had aired. I want to give you a chance at redemption. A voice piped up from the crowd. The last time we were offered redemption by you a lot, 15 men died in a cave-in, starting to seem like there's not a whole lot of difference between the, between the two. The foreman's face turned bleach white, his hands reflectively clenching, but he braced himself for a punishment that never came. Re Real redemption, Karbyshev answered. Not the same old lie you've been getting from the officers. Actual freedom. The crowd collectively murmured. Whatever you did to get here, it'll be wiped away and you'll be equal with us. A lot of you never came or even did anything worth getting here. We're going to change the system, but I need your help. What on earth could you need us for? We'll see what happens. Trust in Yezov. I like this, because I really would like more political power. Yeah, and radar stations actually would be pretty nice, but a quiet war. Comrade Yezov has, in his most private moments with General Karvyshev, expressed doubts of a smooth transition of power after the general's death, the League's fractured state, and the cliques of the officers responsible. The Yezov fears may be just volatile enough to erupt into armed conflict, and the situation isn't handled delicately. And so, General Karvyshev has given him the lead to do so as he sees fit to ensure a peaceful succession. Comrade Yezov has already begun his efforts to grow his own power base and to combat the schemes of his rivals, and uh, yet more must be done. Comrade Yazov will train the Redemptionary Brigades to prepare for even the highest treasons, and he will engage in a scheduled radio broadcast to the League as a whole, earning their loyalty and respect. When the general meets his end, Comrade Yazov will be more than ready to continue his legacy. Trying to get more command power is just really bad. No, actually, uh, which one is better to do? I mean, seriously, 3 to 5... Um, these guys have way less in the field, so I'm actually going to do these guys. That's actually probably much better to do. Cool. The protege. It was early morning in Omsk. Yezov, preceded by a steward, sat down by the training grounds of the league. Out there, in the blur of the distance, the sh shouts of men and gunfire rang in the air. Today, too, was a day of preparation for the great trial. Near him was an empty chair. Comrade Karbyshev was not here today. Yazov shook his head, brushing his face with a gloved hand. Thoughts of betrayal assailed the protege's mind, only for a slight tremor in the air to be banished them. Your coffee, sir, the steward said. Yazov gave him a faint smile. Banish those forms of address, comrade. We are all equal to our duty, he said. But, yes, for now, I will take the coffee. The steward gave a little bow, perhaps unused to this notion of equality among the ranks of the League and laid down his cup in front of him. In the chilly morning air, wisps of steam trailed the jet black liquid. Yezov took it and held it in front of him, staring down at the cold, hard-set eyes reflected in those dark depths, letting the scent immerse him in the memories of long things gone. And things long gone. He took the rim to his lips and drank. They flooded him in an instant, the rich aroma guiding him through the whirling pool of his mind. He remembered the first taste of coffee from before the fall. Then came upon a scene of comrades breaking bread from the freezing weather of the battle winter battlefield, hearing the firewood crackle. Yet an unseen tear gathered in his eyes. They're all dead now. Yazov put his cup down, gritting his teeth. He held it against for held it out for a few moments, pondering whether to finish his drink against common sense. He did. He found the fragments guiding him away from the turmoil of the great patriotic war. Yazov drifted where it led him. Dearest Omsk, dearest homeland, it sat in the cramped and huddled camps of refugee fleeing, refugees fleeing the west. The blood of the Germans spilled, staining even half the world away. He remembered the harsh and bitter coffee of the place, and the dank and sour smell that surrounded him. At that precipice, he, the coffee ceased to be. Yezov stared at the bottom of the cup and smirked. Now is not the time to mourn, but the time for revenge. The great child, above all, is looking kind of handsome, not going to lie. What a handsome fellow. <clears throat> oh, man, now they got rid of it? Oh, come on. I do not want to fight either of these two, because Tomsk? Ooh. Yeah, that's a lot of manpower in the field. I think I might just save it. So, let's just save it for now, and see what happens. Shield of the Motherland. Defense. Oh, we get more political power and war support. That's not bad. Oh, we have minus 11% war support, too. 
the shield of the motherland. We are the last hopes of the motherland in the end, uh, under the Tsars. The Russian worker labored endlessly as a near slave, while the men on top reaped the benefits, providing nothing in return. The Bolsheviks, too, failed the people. Under Bukharin's undisciplined gaze, our military stagnated, and the Germans marched in to annihilate us with near impunity. No more from Omsk, a new order will sweep across the land, one dedicated solely to the protection and vengeance of Russia, and when we march towards or forwards to retake Moscow, the generals, their scientists, and even the fear himself will quake in their boots. When finally the beggars for mercy as their boots rest on their necks, only then will the last trial be avenged. And actually, what happened over here? Uh, it's... Ah. These fine folks over here too, huh? Tell you men. Well, that's not too bad. I much prefer those guys. <sighs> they do have some IFBs, which are... Well, they do have an infantry division right here. Can we see? Oh, that's actually pretty well entrenched. Mm. I want to wipe. I want to wipe. Under the microscope, though. Government Dmitry Temeyovich, do you ever get the feeling you're just being watched? His mentor suddenly, his mentor suddenly questioned caught Yazov off guard. Karbyshev's words hanging in the lukewarm, still air of the bunker. Do you mean the internal security? Yazov began in reply. Not in that sense, Karbyshev added, politely cutting him off. The old man struggled for a moment to find the right words. What I mean is a sense of your actions are consequential, consequential in some respect. We, that we are being examined by those in the future. <clears throat> Not said a sense of destiny, you mean, Yazov replied. I would certainly hope so. We are Russia's destiny. Yazov seemed poised to launch into another round of pr practice slogans, but stopped short. No, quite the opposite, Kavrashev replied, his eyes growing distant and motionless. Have you ever felt the sense that you're nothing more than an insect being stared at through a magnifying glass? That people in the future on the other side of the looking glass of time are looking back on your chores or choices? At a fateful point where everything went wrong, Yazov hunched forward slightly as to speak up, but Kavrashev simply continued, but seeming, seemingly unaware. The other night, Dmitri, I had a dream. A dream of some long time beyond ours, where the people of the far future looked down on ruined and desolate Russia and judged us, the league, as being the ones who led into ruin. I'm not a superstitious man. I'm not scared because I thought the dream was fated to happen, he paused. I'm scared because it was believable. Yazov tried to think of something to say in response, tampering down in a wave of purposeless doubt in his mind. He had a purpose. This was just a cause. No way but forward. In a moment, Karbyshev would surely turn away from the topic. Something here, or something where Yazov could just curl up and once more be a gear in the machine. But Karbyshev didn't. He paused and looked Yazov straight in the eyes. What I'm saying is, do you ever wonder if we're wrong? It's good to have thoughts like that, because if we are wrong, then we can correct ourselves. West Siberian Provisional Authority, we definitely want that. Definitely, 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 definitely. <sighs> I'm sort of waiting. Once we get loot, we'll be on the defensive, and then we can strike out. Because I don't have a lot of faith in us being able to strike out against our enemies. Our guys just are not that strong. At least in my opinion. We have maybe at max 24,000 know, you manpower in the field. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> And all these guys, they have that or way more, so. That is not ideal for us. Research is coming along. After we do all the research stuff, then we'll get some more gun stuff. Actually, I might, after this, I might get more gun stuff. Or even just, hmm. Maybe the land auction, actually. That might be better. Shield of the Motherland, though. More defense, just in case. Alright, and remember the oath. Kind of like that. Both of the against the old guard, both to do refugees flock to Omsk. Fyodor had heard stories of Omsk. Granted, they weren't good ones by any rational standard. In Omsk, it was said that people lived in fear not of bandits, but of policemen. Let the children's soldiers lived in elaborate air raid shelters beneath the ground and dine on armory rations and canned meat packaged with Bukharin still ruled Russia. For a free man, or even one fortunate enough to be born and raised in one of the few countries on the globe that could count itself as being somewhat free and stable, such, as a, prop such a proposition would seem hellish, but for a man who had seen his childhood home torched by two different German armies, his friends and neighbors bayoneted by bandits, and who held on to his two grandchildren as his last worldly possession of any import, such a deal did not seem so bad if true he reasoned that tyranny was odious. But in his painful life, which he had seen the rise and fall of no less than three different Russias, he had known tyranny's cold hands in many forms. He had learned to accept it and live alongside it, regarding it as simply a shadow in the corner, a thing to be acknowledged and worked around in a little else. And so, as Fyodor's refugee caravan approached the checkpoint as a purported, purported border of Omsk Black League and wind whipping at the ragged coat he had stretched over himself and his grandchildren, he felt only security and a sense of relief when the black uniformed men with guns approached them. His journey across his broken homeland had taken him through countless governments and their hollow promises. Time and time again, their lives had nearly taken him away uh, from all that he cared for. But there was a government which promised only one thing, survival. And that was good enough for him. Welcome to Omsk, fellow countryman. Uh, so did something change here? 
West Siberian dudes? No, not really. Not really. Now we have one loot, and now the, the chance of us getting struck is quite a bit higher, but we should do against the old guard. When General Kardovich yeah, first dreamt up the league during the last trial, he envisioned a disciplined army ready to stand for Russia at any moment, unbroken and united in the purpose. Of late, it seems that the officers of the League have lost their way. Bickering and disunity have become the way of life for the league, even to the point where some question the general's authority, but this will end ultimately. <clears throat> At once, measures will be taken to ensure that the old guard are cowed and brought back to the fold by force if necessary. The general knows this will be an uphill battle, but in the end, it is one that must be fought for. If Russia cannot trust its eldest sons, who can trust it? More research speed. We must get it. Um, let's, yeah, let's see you guys over to the left, and you guys over there. Gosh dang it. Uh, I don't like this. I really don't like our position. It's not very good. <laughs> And what are we lacking? Guns? They're just everything. We're just lacking everything. Shields of the motherland? Against the old god. And probably an event, too. Oh, there goes Yugoslavia. Goodbye, Yugoslavia. Goodbye. The shield of the motherland, though, my friends. The perpetual snow and harshness of Siberia stood little chance in the face of an invincible Russian spirit. Construction has begun on a series of bunkers below the city of Omsk that will protect native Russians from any fascist German invaders or bomb. However, its main purpose will be to house their leadership and a sizable number of troops. The expansive complex will not only feature a primary bunker in the heart of Omsk, but two metro systems fanning out across all of the city. While some of the league complained at first of cost overruns and corruption, they no longer will. We have our sword and now it's time to create our shield. German bombs cannot touch us now. Broken men. They've tracked the man for days. He's elusive and was very familiar with the terrain of West Siberia. This only made Victor's blood boil all the more. They recognized his worn uniform on sight. A German dog of the Wehrmacht no less had dared to pollute Russia's soil with his filth. The most frustrating, infuriating thing of them all in Victor's mind was a man's actions. Unlike the filth who had bombed the countryside, he was helping people. He defended families from bandits and slavers, and he aided farmers for only a pittance of food. The dude thought he could be redeemed, but Victor knew that the only redemption the pig would have is death. Victor and his men caught up with the man the next day and immediately began their attack. Despite having the element of surprise, Victor found that the stranger was quickly turning the tables on them. Already three of his men were dead and, uh, dead and another two were wounded. He would not give up power until the dude was dead. Victor threw himself at the man, wrestling him to the ground and stabbing him with his knife. However, before he could get the pig, he felt a burning in his stomach. Victor looked down at the cold steel embedded in his gut and slumped over. The German got to his feet and approached him as he bled out into the snow. He reached down and dragged him to a tree. Victor tried to fight back, but he could hardly move. Then the man began tending to his wound, cleaning it and applying bandages. When he finished, he stood and began to walk away. Victor gathered himself to force out his words. This changes nothing, German pig. You deserve death for your crimes. All you dudes do. I know, he said in reply. This is not the Bogatir, is it? This might be the Bogatir. It might be the Bogatir. Or maybe not. I don't know. We're against the old guard. Enforce discipline? Let's break the cliques. That's something good to do. Blame for the League's current state is not wholly on the shoulders of the rank and file, as much as the general wishes it was so. A broken roof does not destroy a house, but rotten foundations will. A source of so many woes plaguing the League will be traced back to the one ever-present threat, the Office of Cliques. Those meant to command the League in a new age have lost their way and fallen into uh, decadence that threatened the destruction of Russia during the last trial. <clears throat> Though he grows more weary by the day. <clears throat> General Kardashev will continue his reforms. He will not allow all that has done to be for nothing. The League must endure, but for that to happen, some sense must be restored to the officers. Perhaps now he hopes that they finally will listen. Bandits attack us. They came just after the sunset. The wind, dry wind carrying their shouts and the clatter of hooves. Half of them didn't even know the name of the town, but that wasn't the point. They were there for plunder, pure and simple. Such a barbaric event would be unthinkable in the League's core, around Omsk itself, or in any of the state's major cities. But on these wind-swept wind steeps, where borders were just an idea, the League's presence in small villages often amounted to a little more than a few under-equipped frontline or garrison cadres. For what it's worth, they acquitted themselves quickly, or themselves well. <clears throat> The men and women of Cadres, 10, 3, 8, 5, 8, 10, 9, 6, 6, 3, and 10, 9, 6, 6, 7, fought as best as they could to protect the agricultural workers stationed there, but they were caught off guard by the bandits' brazen raid. But by about 9 that night, it was all over, their lives either already snuffed out or draining away fast. By the next day, they would be added to the ever-growing list of martyrs, and the high command would be charged with dealing with the situation. We'd find the people who do this and make them pay, shore up our existing settlements so this doesn't happen again. we get political power, a fort, and lose stability. No, we're going to find the people who made this. Now we're gonna go straight all as fast as we fast and as hard as we can to find the people who did this. Oh look at this, Tomsk. <clears throat> Probably love uh, one of my favorite uh, leaders for Tomsk, Shostakovich. Ah, an ultimatum. Here we go. 
<laughs> we have reached or received an ultimatum from Kokichao. Kok Shatao. They're demanding that we hand over a tribute of loot, or else they will raid us and take it over, away from us anyways. We are at impasse to decide, so do we decide to engage in confrontation with these people, or possibly risking our men dying at the hands of our enemies? Or do we instead stand down and cave into their demands, giving them the desired loot, allowing them, our men to live to fight another day? Well, the hell with these peoples. Yeah, I don't want to. Oh, the enemy's defeated. Recent reports have been sent in from an overwhelming victory against a recent party of raiding bandits. In a brutal standoff, they were decimated by our valiant defense forces, and now their bodies lie scattered and mutilated by war. With survivors dashing for cover and retreating into the mystery frontiers, our soldiers chant songs of victory and heroism in the face of invading evil. The rush of bloody defeat will certainly teach them a lesson about the attacking the lands of Omsk for years to come. Now to cleaning up the corpses. We've got more political power, stability, and a few more guns. Exactly what we needed. Yeah, I'm not going to raid against Omsk. They're just too big. Now, they only have four to eight divisions. That's really not bad, though. But we only have four divisions. Which, in my estimates, is not super bueno. You're really good in defense, though, man. This guy is really good in defense. Holy cow. Uh, who do we have here? Anything? Yeah, let's tell the same thing. Cool. Civil rights have 62. All right, good luck. An ultimatum. All right, from Tomsk this time. Well, if you like to read about this, go right ahead. I mean, I've already read it once. I don't want to read it again, so... I don't know. And actually, I'm glad we have this general here just because he's really good in defense. Not bad. But you know what is bad? I just finished my coffee. Give our guys time to get some more organization. And against the old god, very good. <clears throat> Breaking the cliques. Uh, did I already read this? Um, I think I already read this. Yeah, I did read this one already. Cool. Oh God. Kubashev had thought back to the birth of the Black League a lot more recently. Perhaps it was because he knew things were coming to end soon for himself anyway. He smiled at the thought of those early days when his vision had been so clear in the path towards national redemption seemed so obvious. It was overjoyed when many of his officers and old comrades joined a volunteer or volunteered to join the League and help them save the motherland. If only they'd stayed true to the word and not fallen astray. Perhaps even then they'd simply conceded or concealed their cynicism from him. And always planned to use the League as a pitch to a personal health and power. The old general prayed it wasn't so. <clears throat> he did not want to consider that so many of his friends might have always been as corrupt and power hungry, but them, if the League had made them this way, was that any better? I'm not going to back down. He had spoken with Karl Hardin yesterday about the growing corruption in the League and what might be done about it. As always happened when he brought these things to Alexander, he was generally chastised for making mountains of out of molehills when they were more important issues to focus on. He didn't have the heart to tell Alexander he knew that, that he was skimming money off the budget for his personal projects. It wouldn't have mattered if he had. Just like all of Karbyshev's older friends, Har Hardim seemed to think of him as more of a puppet than an ally these days, someone to prop up for the League while profiting off its members. <clears throat> Karbyshev inserted a piece of paper into a typewriter and began to write a memo laying out a plan to eliminate corruption in the League's ranks. He knew it would be ignored, and all the others had been, but he would not give up now. His mother and needed him, and he would not abandon her even if, they even, if, even if everyone else had. There's no rest for the wary. Scavenge for loot. And it seems like we're winning so far, which is pretty good. <clears throat> if this is the case... Alright, enemies defeated. If you'd like to read about this, we've already read it once. We'll go right ahead. Uh, do they not have loot? Oh, come on. Now to cleaning up the corpses. Oh, these guys. I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, we'll do it against these guys. Well, you're level 3 of attack. I prefer level 5. Let's go ahead and start doing it. <clears throat> but we must enforce discipline, but a fitting end. Move. Cadre 10, 4, 9, 2, 4 moves silently through the forest towards the sounds of raucous laughter and roaring bonfires. A small encampment belonged to those raiders who had so brazenly attacked then only a couple days before. Now it's time for their just rewards. Five full cadres of well-armed infantry made a quarter circle as they moved towards the clearing where the drunken bandits enjoyed their revelry. There was a click of bipods unfolding and the soft ticks of safeties and a crunch of soldiers laying prone in soft snow. Pick your targets and wait for the signal. <clears throat> After what felt like ages, a squawk came over the radio. Open fire. The ill-conceived party became a hellscape within seconds. Tracers ripped through their tents, horses, men, trees, everything in sight. Some were shot where they sat, drinking and yelling. Others had time to emerge, stumbling from their tents, only to be shot down in an orgy of violence. <clears throat> After a couple minutes of continuous fire, the encampment was utterly ruined. A soft moaning sound flew into the night and would not be heated. The slow line of black-clad soldiers were there to check for survivors. They would not survive much longer. Some 
Keep some for interrogation. We must prevent future incidents. Good. <coughs> Enforce discipline. Well, the journal's reforms have perhaps not had the desired effect as of yet, he's not an auto man and will not allow himself to sink into inaction and despair. Many low level commanders within the league report as of indiscipline and cowardice among the lower ranks. Infighting has become commonplace among the men and women that are supposedly Russia's saviors. Perhaps a strong approach is needed. General Kardashev will work to enforce greater discipline in the ranks. Drills will be held twice a day. Meals will be shortened to 10 minutes. And dissenters will be given harsh punishments. The officers need only obey their orders. Very good. Authoritarian socialists, huh? In my ultra-nationalist paradise? I don't think so. <clears throat> Pay up, boys. They refuse tribute, as expected, Pavlodar. As those they reject are often ready for battle, we must ready our men to prepare for the fight. Alas, bloodshed is sometimes unavoidable, and we must prepare for what is to come. Even if they aren't going to cooperate, it is time we take the loot from Pavlodar by force. Selavi. <clears throat> now, you're not the person I wanted to lead us, but whatever. Ray successful reports have returned to men hurry home with trucks full of loot. Ooh, SP wins in Scotland. And blood smeared over their hands. They congratulate each other for the successful raid against the unsuspected enemy, patting their comrades on the back and taking the last few shots of the survivors scurrying away. We proclaim victory in the skirmish as our men cheer and whistle in the hysteria of war, eager to present to the us the treasures they've prized from the grips of our adversaries. Seize all that we can use. Amen. And let's go ahead and grab some agricultural methods, because that's the second best one to do, in my opinion. We've got enforced discipline, though. <clears throat> Followed up with the final speech. As the journal surveys the results of his hard-fought reforms, he is forced with one bitter, inalienable truth. He has failed. Oh, boy. As his health worsens more and more, the once proud founder of the League finds himself desperate. The League sprawls towards disaster, and yet none save Comrade Yazov heeds his words. Though discouraged, the general has not lost all hope. It's called a general assembly of the League, and will give one last impassioned speech, begging women, children, and men that all call arms come to look with in and recognize the course of disaster the officers have put them on. Across the League's land, the general voice will be broadcast his last order. Be ready for the trials ahead. <clears throat> An ultimatum? Oh, wait. We're, li we're literally just right here. A futile effort. Oh, if you like to read about this, go right ahead. But, <clears throat> gentlemen, please settle down. I brought you here today to discuss a very important matter today, and I need your attention. Karbyshev sat at the head of the desk, watching Sakharovsky and Valukin shouting at each other, and each accusing each other of corruption, treason, and a dozen other things. They had not been in the room for five minutes, and already things were getting out of hand. Gentlemen, please stop arguing for one moment. Gorbachev managed to get a desperate shout over the bickering, though doing so winded him and had to sit down. Reluctantly, both men quieted down and turned to him. Does anyone know where Karhardin is going to arrive? Going to arrive? Gorbachev asked, gasping for breath after his outburst. He isn't coming, Valukhin replied. He said he has important business and requests a briefing or whatever we discussed. I told him this was important. I know, Dmitri. I'm just telling you what he told me. Very well. We have to catch him up to speed later. I need to talk to all of you about the rampant... Factionalism I'm seeing in the league. Recently there's been... Dimitri, I don't mean to interrupt, but before we continue, I must say something. Sakharovsky interjected, the only one responsible for factionalism is a traitor sitting across from me. I'm the traitor of Bakulin. Bakulin replied, those are bold words coming from you. You don't think I don't know about your private security force? The two men descended into the incessant squabbling. Karbyshev decided in despair and turned to look out the window at the snow-covered gardens. It was going to be a long day. There's no hope for them. And now we have food for the hungry. At long last, everyone finally has food for the night, and we need no longer work on empty bellies and broken hearts. Living off of half rations for months has taught us all temperance and composure, but not at our minds in a silent and icy hysteria. Now we have plenty of food for generations to come, and the people of Oms can begin their toils without hunger bothering them throughout their maddeningly tiresome days. Guess we're not going hungry tonight, which is a great, great thing, even though we can really use some more stability and some political power. And in which we are still doing enforcing discipline, and of course the final speech, we've already read I believe, so be ready for the trials ahead my friends, for they will not be easy. And right now, we're funding agricultural methods, actually we haven't looked at this yet. So right now, our poverty rate, while it's 50 to 80%, it's still going down, you know, that's not good. It'll slowly go, you know, up eventually. Equipment is actually going up at two a month, which is not bad. Uh, industrial expertise is going down slowly. Anything else? Nuclear stockpile probably not going up. Agriculture's not going up. Research facilities are not going up. Academic base is actually deteriorating right now. But the discipline in the ranks. The reports on the forums was not good. Not good at all. Garbashev ran his hands through what little Harry still had. Was this really all what it had come to? Could he not even get junior officers to follow uh, his orders anymore? Some cadres had refused to drill twice a day, while others had drilled twice but only for half as long as they normally would each time. It's ordered that meals be shortened and thus seem to have been ignored entirely. No one's being punished for their disobedience because people responsible 
or for carrying out the punishments were just as non-compliant as all the rest. He held back on ordering harsh treatments for so long because he wanted to believe that the members of the League would realize the error of their ways on their own. He now saw that just how naive he had been. The League was further gone than he dared to imagine. Deep inside of himself, a small voice questioned if it was still worth the effort. He crushed that voice as he had done so many times in the past. He had made his choices years ago when he created the League and he was far too long to doubt starting himself now. The League had wandered off course, and he would spend whatever time he had left trying to get it back on track. His legacy depended on him. Russia depended on him. He could not abandon his nation, but when so many people already had, he believed, before all else in Russia, one indivisible invincible. So long as he lived, there would remain at least one member of the League who stayed true to his principles. They were all he, they were all he had left. How can order be maintained without discipline? We lose some more stability. Oh, gosh darn it. It almost looks like just 20%, but it's negative 20%. Hmm. Alright, so you guys don't have money or treasure. You guys don't have treasure. You guys don't have treasure either. Uh, the Republic of Pavlodar does not. No one has treasure except Tayumen. Two men. So. Eh. Also, I made sure that these cavalry divisions are actually called garrisons, so we can actually use them as garrisons. We should probably get some military police eventually, so. That would be good, but only when we have, like, three research slots. Uh, God help us all. Yeah, we're going to need some help with that. Uh, our stockpile of stuff. Infantry. Guns are looking pretty good, actually. We do need quite a bit more artillery, though, as well. So, I don't want to do this, but we might need to switch things over to two artillery. Well, let's at least leave it on two for that for now. And the final speech, and then remember the oath. Every member of the Black League knows the words of the oath by heart. I believe before all else in Russia, what indivisible and invincible. I believe in my own strength and the strength of my comrades. I reject the lies of the first trial and embrace the Black League as Russia's one and only salvation in the coming trial. When the day of the great trial comes, I will stand shoulder to shoulder with my comrades. I will face the enemy without fear and I will put my nation before my own life. I will be the sword and shield of Russia by which justice will be done for the fallen. I swear this oath by my sacred motherland. An ultimatum by the cock people. Ah, the old general speaks. Comrades, countrymen, fellow members of the League, thank you for joining me here today. It's been some time since I've made a public address, but there are matters of vital importance that must be discussed, and I believe that each and every one of you deserves to be involved in that discussion. I know in my heart that every member of the Black League believes in our mission, from myself to the rank-and-file members of the cadres. All of us want a strong, united Russian nation to understand the Black League is the best organization to accomplish that goal. But in recent years, we have been consumed by distractions and division, and I fear we have strayed away from our objective. I've seen troubling signs of infighting and factionalism from my subordinates and from many of many officers of the League. Let me be clear that there's no room for factionalism within the Black League. If Russia is to be claimed from the directors, we must work with a unity of purpose, united by our love of our motherland. I am troubled that I must remind everyone that your loyalty is not to your superiors, but the Black League itself. I've also uncovered extensive networks of corruption from high-ranking members of the League. I will not identify names here as I believe in offering a chance of redemption to all, but let me be clear that if this corruption continues, there will be consequences for all of us. I, if, you, if any of you believe that you know of any corrupt or unpatriotic behavior, I urge you to report the suspect and make sure that the justice is done. The greatest betrayal a League member can commit is placing their own needs above those of that of the Russian people. I had hoped that matters could be solved internally, but I realized that they are too widespread to be discussed in public, or not to be discussed in public. I hope that by addressing you, the patriots who make up the foundation of the League, that we might be able to finally put an end to factionalism and corruption and restore the League we all believe in to its original purpose. Thank you all and good night, but does anyone listen? Karbyshev's birthday. The white tablecloth hung limp like a shroud on a casket. The hot, coagulated air seemed to stand still in the room, sending pricklings of discomfort around the skin of those there. Walters, or waiters, scurried to across an invisible line in the middle of the room, seemingly afraid of the psychic consequences of standing near such a powerfully charged fault line. One On one side of the table, a meagre a menagerie of unimportant functionaries, Karbyshev among them, his face recalling some timeless monolithic statues, disp dispassion said all that was needed. On the other hand, the old guard stole it stolid, intransigent, and unabashed. In the background, muffled by wiles and walls, there were gunshots. Glavkerovich, Abu Abakumov, intoned with a bare minimum of effort. I regret to interrupt this luncheon with a me such an uproar, but the plot was uncovered against the leadership of our league. He paused for effect, throwing a glance at the men seated at the table. It has been dealt with. Karabashev, of, no, of course, knew all too well that what was happening, and his heart sank. It was all over. His plan, no, he had failed. But do not go, go down quietly. Abu Kumov and one of his or one of his cronies was in the middle of gloating when a withering stare across the room, his words falling to the floor like a dead bird. Ten years from now, Kabrashev almost whispered before raising his volume tenfold. Ten years from now, you people I once called my comrades have betrayed my trust, and since then I've been nothing but a window dressing for continued victimization of our people. I watched you send women and children to war armed with uh, museum pieces. He paused, rising from the table and letting his chair fall to the floor. I see you for who you really are now. You rats are just as treasonous as Lasov and his vermin. Kabrashev spat with pure venom, animated by a terrible anger. I've lost many things from the waste that fed us in the camps, muscles, fat, teeth, but not my convictions. You animals never had, to, had any to begin with.
Nice. Of course, we do have the border war right now. Um, we're the ones defending, but it's over here, huh? All right. Well, Western Siberian People's Republic. I really don't want to try it against them. Because even, look at our guys now. We don't even have enough, like, guns to attack, so. Enemies defeated, if you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. Good, more guns. Helps our stability out, too, so. Uh, did anyone else have loot? None of you guys have loot. We have one loot, so which is good for us to defend and win. We win the battles. We do actually fairly okay, so. Ah, uh, Dimitri. Not looking too good right now, Dimitri. We got a lot of political power, but I think we've got to save it, right? Oh, you guys. Um, well, let's see. I w using the, I kind of like using our treasure as bait. So this way, people want to come in and hurt us, maybe. An ultimatum. Ooh. Noble Sibirsk. Ooh, I actually, we've not been able to fight these guys yet, so. He's good, really good on defense, the guy we have right now. Uh, Western, yeah, they don't have treasure, so. we got about 10, 11 days. Remember the oath. And watch the borders. One of the few things everyone in the league agrees on is that we are utterly surrounded by enemies. Kaganovich. The greatest threat rules with an iron fist over two men and the surrounding territories. And it's no secret that, if given the chance, we'll be more than happy to invade our small statelet. If Kagnovich thinks that we will not go without a fight, he is mistaken. Yazov will personally oversee the construction of new several lines of defense along the borders, as well as the repair of the old radar station. When Kagnovich comes, for one day he w it will come, we'll be more than ready to crush him. Karabishov's condition. But let's go ahead and do this first. Anywhere from Abu Kamov, Karabishov asked, already knowing the answer. None, replied Kassan Magomedov. <coughs> The young Tata lieutenant, who served as the old general's aide de camp. Likely he's still recovering from the tongue lashing you gave him, Karbyshev chuckled. The young officer was technically Karbyshev's countryman in a way. Karbyshev himself was of a, a, a Tartar, albeit Siberian and Orthodox extraction, and Magomedov hailed from Tatarstan proper, but nationality wasn't why Glavkorovker had insisted on this man serving as his assistant for the past decade. Haven't you seen the doctor's report? asked Karbyshev. Magomedov shook his head. The Glavkorver. Glavkorver. Uh, poured two glasses of vodka and mentioned his aid, gesturing over to a chair next to his desk. Once Magomedov was seated with his drink, Karbyshev continued. Nothing you probably haven't already known or haven't heard on the grapevine. He took a long sip of vodka, his eyes almost wistful. Doctor says I'm not long for this world, kidneys are going out, plus half a dozen other things. Magomedov's face went white, not so much because he was unaware of this fact as he as because responding to such a statement was not the easiest task. Karbyshev had sensed this immediately and filled the void and said, I know, not the easiest line to follow up on. One way I put it, I suppose, replied Magomedov, gathered his wits. Have you figured out, you know, final wishes and such? In my process of doing so, I assure you. But you can have anything from my office and quarters when I go. Both men laughed, and for a moment, the oncoming specter of death didn't seem so immediate. A toast then to what time is left. Loot for looting is nice. Ooh, these guys, yeah. And which I want the very fierce general to do this. Very good. Doesn't really matter. Get some planning done. We got a lot of political power that we're going to spend for later. Alrighty, tidy. It's one loot, two loot, three loot, more loot. We always got to watch them borders. You never know what might happen. Three, two, one. Rate it up. Clock is severely injured. Troubling news from a troubled land. Pay? Oh, they pay the tribute. Great. Uh, miraculously, Kok Shitao has caved in and paid his tribute, handing over desired loot from her state. From their state, bloodshed has been avoided, and her men live to fight another day. It is unlikely that Kok Shitao, Kok Shitao, is to surrender to us again so easily in the future. The rest are sometimes needed to survive in the anarchy of Russia. Equipment, uh, actually, well, we kind of already saw this down here. I can't help with the poverty rate. I do want to do expertise just so it's not going down anymore. So either academic base or. Uh, expertise. Equipment I would love, but academic base, let's go and do that, just so that now it'll go back up, which is nice. After watching the boards, we have falling snow. In the end, the monster that General Karbyshev created has grown out of control. Even as life fades from his body, the officers circle like vultures, ready to pounce and tear the league's bloody limb, corpse limb from limb. The general sees a great trial approaching closer and closer by the day, and yet he knows now he will not be able to be able to, one to face it. But perhaps there is one who can. General Karbyshev will thus perform one last act on the surfaces of the motherland, knowing that Karman Yazov, with his useful drive and determination, will complete the general's mission. It is time to take a stroll. Pavlodar, your turn for the little conflict we have here, huh? I can't wait to destroy them. And what do we have here? 
Oh, we can buy anti-tank? You know what? We'll try. It's only 10 political power, and we get 0.17 every day. It's not great, but not bad. Give the guys a few more days, and then we'll have a good time. We will not back down so easily. Good. Are they fighting a, a river? They should be. Constantin Pastanagov. Alright, well, whatever. The falling snow. The end draws near. Oh, how sad. The enemy's defeated. Glorious. And do we really have one treasure? No, we have no loot. Treasure, loot, whatever it is. Mm, you guys might actually try to tra strike us again, so we'll see what happens. Led by Karbyshev's last few days. Gautamashev mentioned Mag Magomedev over to the side table in his office, glancing around furtively before speaking up, not in Russian, but in Tartar's other native language. Listen, Kassan, said the old general with a grim seriousness in his voice, when I die, well, I have faith in Yezov. I'm a moment past, but if things go badly, go north, and tell them Yelena sent you. Magomedov replied with a look of mild disbelief. My daughter, yes. Karbyshev responded, she's smarter than I am, truth be told, got out when she still could. His eyes grew di distant, as if imagining another time when and what could have been. But I've got a thing for a lost cause, I suppose. I stayed, and this monstrosity was built around me, built on me. Dmitri, I... Megadov stumbled at a loss for words. I really can't express my thanks, but Dmitri, why me? You know, you're the, one of the only people that calls me that. Just Dmitri. That's because you asked me to, sir. I ask everyone to do that. They don't. Even Yazov can't bring himself to, and that's part of why I care about what happens to you after I'm gone. See, when Yelena defected, I knew it was for the best, but that took away one of the last people who would sit down and talk to me as a human being, as a friend, and not just worship me or try to get favors. I'm practically the only one left now. I sit up here in heaven and watch and watch all those people down below file into church, as it were, and pay their respects. And then their little ceremonies end, and they all go back to ignore me and everything I stood for. I'm not a real person to them anymore. I'm just an image myth. The old man sat back in the chair. That's why I care. Because the pedestal is the loneliest place in the world. Oh, man. No! No! Karabashev. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Which I should be. And with this, this man, he has off. He's going to be very offensive. And he's going to be able to move very quickly. It's a big sadness. Big, big sadness. Uh, I did say I want to do some land doctrine stuff because we need it, so. Interactions with widespread from the soldiers. Armor defense. Soft attack. Uh, I usually go with this one. Ex to excel. That's, that's nice. I want to go combine operations for this campaign. I do want to get, maybe get some tanks eventually. That'd be kind of nice. Falling snow. Don't leave us. Omar. Oh, huh. All right. So, do we, how many? We should have plenty of guns now, right? Plenty of guns, and we're going to need plenty of guns too to help put down resistance when we take more land. So, in the state of Israel, will Jews and Arabs ever get along? Of course not. Well, actually, maybe, but probably not. <clears throat> I'd say once we get two thousand pieces of infantry equipment, then maybe we'll shift one thing over and put it on anti-tank because we want you know bigger divisions, of course. Wow, quite a bit of lag. But happy nineteen sixty-three, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. Walsh Unionists win elections. Britain is not a dream. All right. Um, you're still not building anything here, which is really saddening, but... Oh, you know what? That's gets through that. The Zoss order failed. Uh, if you'd like to read about this, just go right ahead. Uh, this happens pretty much every campaign, you know, or usually so. Oh, uh, a particular foreign minister. It was a front. Nearly the whole foreign ministry was a front. Yes, there were state meetings, lowly assemblies with a, low few, with a few low-ranking diplomats from bordering warlords. That is... That was it, though. What was not a front, however, was Alexander Sakharovsky and his gang of plotters. Every night, after conducting their normal business, they would retreat to room 4 on Hall, on Hall 5 on the third floor for the war ministry, usually. They would leave early in the morning hours. Sometimes they remain there till dawn, coming out with heavy coats and looking more tired than everyone else. Now, to most outsiders who had never heard of the theory of terror, it seemed like some crackpot science, something invented by a New England liberal arts professor who had little too much coffee and read a little too much Jean-Paul Marat and Hevet. On closer inspection, it began to seem more exact. Sakharovsky has stumbled upon what he believed to be the prettiest form of justice, terror. After all, was it not Robespierre, who wrote terror is only just as prompt, severe, and inflexible? Was terror not the most effective means of moving men to do unimaginable things, to make them recoil at the mouse? To make them get in line with a murderous totalitarian government? If Sakharovsky could master the art of wielding terror, then he could master the world. So Sakharovsky was toiled away in room 4 on Hall 5 on the third floor, surrounded by books and driving the lady into the night. When the time came for the great trial came, terror would be on their side. And falling snow. 
The death of Kardashev, it was over. All the old marshal's schemes had failed once. He had fancied himself the pilot of the great ship that his beloved league. Perhaps he even had even this had been true. But in a way that only human beings could, Dmitry Mikhailovich Kardashev had deluded himself, thinking himself to be sailing Russia to a new dawn when he was little more than a wooden figure carved, out, carved on a prow. All the papers strewn across his desk were now little more than butterflies without wings. Perhaps a walk outside would clear things up. It wasn't like there was any other option left. The old marshal left his office, passing through multiple security checkpoints on the way out, and catching more than a few surprised glances, yet at the same time he felt invisible. The only person who ever asked his business was Magomedov, slumped half awake behind his security desk. As the old... Cold night time wind was whipped against Karbyshev's old frame. He felt a strange sense of peace. Certainly, it was one tinge with sorrow, sorrow that had not done enough, that he could not do more, yet the hot, heavy anguish that had racked him for the past five years was gone. Looking up at the snowy night sky, watching the snowflakes emerge from the darkness, the old general felt as if he had done his part. What would be, would be. Later, the faintest hint of a smile crept across his wrinkled face. He waved to the sentries at the guardhouse as he walked out of the main gate of the command compound and strode into a corpse of trees towards the riverbank half frozen by the early Siberian winter. The little creek babbled softly at the general's feet, flapping up against the icy ground. His boots quivered on the slick rocks of the riverbank. He didn't struggle when the cold waters claimed him. The next morning, the internal security men would ask Magomedov a thousand times over what, what it was Karbyshev that said to him before leaving. I am going outside and may be some time. Well, now the ultra national's party would be called Chernia Liga. The fascist party will now be called Chernia Liga. <clears throat> oh, he lose 100 political power. Wow. A puppet in all but name with a new leadership. We get more political power, organization, recruitable pop population factor uh, rate. Oh, boy. Oh, my goodness. And I'm going to read one more focus before we get there. So look at that. Cheer to the motherland. Prepare for the storm. And then those who are left behind. It had been a few days since Comrade Karbyshev took his walk to the woods and did not return. Yet today, Yazov took his usual seat next to the old man's side, waiting for his return. Today, too, the fields were noisy with men training for the trial. The two cups sat in the cold, their steaming, steam, steaming, streaming into the air in smooth wisps before dissipating. He leaned back into his chair, growing sleepy as he worried, as worry and concern faded from the creases of his face. Comrade Karbyshev was not so weak that a chilly wind could kill him. He would return and lead the, glory, the league to glory. He squinted. Now is not the moment to grow complacent. What would the man think of him if he found Yazov dozing off before their appointed meeting? Yazov sat up, elbows on his knees, tapping his fingers as hours passed and the day stretched to the evening. The cold breeze blew between the trees, and the training field grew silent as men trooped to dinner and Arthur, other martial business. The stern clouds looked at earth and seemed to grow greater and greater in disappointment or wrath. Still, Karbyshev did not appear. He was old, however, and maybe his creaky joints made him late. Yazov laughed, but it was hollow. Aides and officers came out of the offices, begging him to return to the quarters. A storm grew in the distance, and the clouds grew stark, steely in outlook. The sun went down and fell snow. And snow fell. Hmm. First in a gentle dusting, then as a thick, heavy blanket. The cool breeze became a frigid gale. The cool breeze became lashes of frozen air. Still, Yazov sat waiting, his fingers clasped together. Breathing with every shiver and shock, an aide breathing through the harsh winter came beside him. Yazov was still. Sir, the aide said, it might be time to rest. You will be saddened, you will saddened Comrade Karbyshev deeply for your returns. Yazov stood, gathering all his strength to speak amid all the din of the storm. Yazov spoke in a weak and broken voice. Yes, I, I will rest now. Thank you, Comrade. The only words Comrade Karbyshev could not keep. Still in the focus, huh? A terrible day for rain. The rain poured from the silent streets of Omsk as the procession marched through the streets. The drumming of rain upon gravel and boot upon stone drowning out all life. In the center of the column of wordless soldiers, a simple wooden coffin rested upon the hands of a chosen few. As they marched through the city, a flash of light momentarily lit the stony faces of those marching before a crushing boom of thunder echoed overhead. At the front of the column, arms aching, bearing the weight of the left side of the coffin upon his shoulders, marched Dmitry Yazov. He was great before the night and for the rain, for it would let none see the tears as they flowed freely down his cheeks. He was still garbled, garbed in the uniform of General Karbyshev's closest follower, not a leader, just a follower. As the procession passed apartment block after block, the residents, garbed in their own uniforms, filed orderly out of their homes and joined the procession. Not a word was spoken among the men and women of the Black League as they marched their great general's body throughout the streets. They marched for what seemed hours of the city proper and passed the training fields, and along the way, more and more people joined the march all for one night. They would put their differences aside. For one night, the entire Black League stood united in mourning. Eventually, they reached the destination, the highest hill in the land that the league controlled, a suitable final resting place for the man who had given them so much. Yazov exhaled deeply as he knelt with the others carrying the coffin, lowering it on the oh so gently down into the tomb. A single choked sob left his throat before he stood, gazing at the simple black league before him. A small podium had been arranged just behind the grave. He walked unsteadily first and confidently, then with utter calm to the podium. He looked down at his people below. The black league watched him with complete attention, each man and woman standing wrapped and alert. In his heart of hearts, Yazov knew that it was not over. He turned on the microphone and began to speak. Soldiers, workers, comrades, lend your general your ears. And it shall end with all hail, Comrade Yazov!
Juno Karvachev, the hero of Russia, founder of the Black League and mentor of Dmitry Yazov, has died. In his place, General Yazov rises like a phoenix, ready to avenge his teacher's manipulation by the officer cliques plaguing the nation, and above all, ready to battle the Hun one last time, while those who cause the league's very rot bemoan the general's succession and decry his influence. Plodding in the shadows, they forgot one thing. General Yazov is not his forefather. These worms will be exposed for the scum they are, and crushed under his boot, there can be no other outcome, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow when the reclamation of Russia will most likely begin. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.